Good morning. Happy Sabbath. The Myersburg Seventh-day Adventist Church welcomes all of you here today. Those of you on YouTube, we are happy that you chose to be with us. And we have a lot of things to cover this morning. We're going to start with the unfortunate news first. We do have a second reading on a membership change. Sherry Wright Young is requesting to be removed from the church membership. So we need to take a vote today. Do we have um, a second on the move? Second. All those in the favor, please raise your right hand. With regret. With regret. Now, the next thing is ladies' tea. Um, there is a uh, thing in the bulletin that we need to go to. The ladies that would like to go, it's nice that you let Pastor know that you want to ride. But we also need to go to the website and go online to register because they do have limited space and they want to do a head count. So if you go to the uh, the one they have at the Tills Plains Church and let them know that you're planning to be there, that would be awesome. And our Pathfinders are on a camp out this weekend, so hope and pray for no prayer for, or rain for them today. I love those things. They were so fun. And we have another good news. Um, great big thanks to all of you. We will put the card out there if you would like to see it, but I'd like to read it to you. Dear Charlotte and Choir, thank you for inviting us to sing with your choir for Easter. What a joy and a blessing to praise God with your beautiful voices. Hopefully, we will be able to do something similar in the not-too-distant future. God bless your ministry. You are so very nice. Blessings, Becky Reinhardt, on behalf of the Grace Lutheran Church. Very nice. Thank you. Now, if I can find where it went to. Um... We have a what, Thursday night meeting um, where we get together and we share the challenges, the hang-ups, the habits in our life and how God has blessed us or we get encouragement and strength from each other. And the topic this Thursday was on hope and we only went through part of it and there was something that followed that I thought I would share with you today. It's in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 8. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith or of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on this blessed Sabbath day, we humbly come before you, thanking you for the blessings of the spring, for the blossoming of the iris and the peonies getting ready to come out, for the little goslings that are waddling around, being trained by their parents. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with a new birth. Let us be blessed today in your presence. 
and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So happy that you're here to worship with us. Orange. Thank you. I'm so grateful that we serve a risen Savior, aren't you? Um, he has done so much for each and every one of us. And this morning, I would like us to stand together as we sing Because He Lives. Thank you. 
this song is just one of the most beautiful worship songs. And I pray right now that as we go into this worship and we worship God, that you will just let the love flow into your heart. Amen. so good. We want to invite our kids up here to come and sing this celebration song of how great is our God. And we've got some instruments for you if you want to come play an instrument. Some of you can come stand right here in front of Dave and I if you want to. Yeah, come on. Come on down. Come on this way. All right, here comes David. You. Thank you. All right. Here comes a couple more to help us out. <laughs> Grab your instruments. Oh, grab an instrument right here, sweetie. Look, right here. <laughs> All right, Terry, let's go ahead and start. The splendor of the king. 
clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in delight, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three. The Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And I will see how great, how great is our God. Thank you, children. And now it's that special time to pick up offering to collect those dollars for Adventurers Ministry here at Miamisburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. Hold the dollars high. Back in the back also, I see a lot of dollars back in the back. Start, start in the back and work your way forward. <laughs> There's still some all the way in the back there. Okay. up and put them in the church up here. And then have a seat. <laughs> Go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> That's all. Come on up. Good 
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. You too. I always have a question, and one of my, my questions right now is hard, because I'm going to ask you if you remembered some question I asked several months ago. <laughs> you remember when I asked, what is there, who is the church? Who is the church? Remember when I asked that question? No, you don't. I didn't think you would. <laughs> anyway, who is the church? God. No, the church, well, God is part of the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. And who is the head of the church? Jesus. Right, Jesus. Jesus. Have you ever talked to somebody else about church, about you're going to church? Have you ever talked to anybody else about church? You did? What did they say? They said they go to church too? Okay. Sometimes we'll talk to people that make fun of us because we go to church. Sometimes they'll talk, make fun of us because they say we believe in Jesus. But that's okay, because Jesus is the head of the church. And Jesus said he will protect the church, which means he will protect us. So when we're out and talking to other people, and this will happen when you get older, I'm sure, you'll uh, maybe run into people that really, really make fun of you, really think you're weird, you're crazy, because you believe in Jesus. But don't let that bother you, because Jesus will watch over us and protect us. Jesus said, I am the head of the church, and we are the church, and he will take care of us. So remember, when things aren't going the way we would like sometimes, especially with friends, uh, that Jesus is always our best friend, and he will watch over us, and he will take care of us. So don't be afraid. Don't be, uh, don't be shy in telling others about Jesus. And no matter what happens, just know that Jesus is always with us. Anyone want to close with a quick prayer? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are with us and watch over us and protect us. Help us to always remember. In your name, amen. You can go back to your seats now. Thank you. The scripture I'd like to share with you this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 13, starting with verse 15. Therefore... Let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that pleases God. So as we do our offering call this morning, remember that offering is so much more than just money. Offering is our time, our talent, helping others. And the Lord comes to, says to us, let that be our sacrifice of praise. Let us do good for others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the reminder this morning that you've called us to give of ourselves as you've given to us. Lord, may we be kind and considerate and loving towards others. And Lord, may we give as you've called us to give. Bless the offerings today, and may they bring, be multiplied for your glory and honor is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Here at Miamisburg, we can give in the offering box out in the foyer, you can mail it to the church, or you can give at Adventist Giving Online. Thank you. Now is my favorite time. 
next to the sermon, you know, the singing. Anyway, um, this is when, okay, this is when the microphones are going to come around. So anyone that has a praise or a request for prayer, please request or, or help share it with us. Um, as I said before, I iris are blooming and the peonies are about to open up too. We've had the little goslings going around. Not as many as last year, but they're still cute, even though they grow up. But God is good. In the backyard, we have trees around, and it's like living in our own aviary. Make sure I say the right word, because you hear all the birds singing, and you see them flying by, and being on the third floor and looking out the window and seeing all the birds going by. And you just know they're getting ready to bring more babies into the world, so that's exciting. I love spring. So um, the microphones are coming around. First off, I'd like to say welcome to my sister-in-law in Florida who watches every week. And second, uh, my mother and father-in-law, I mean, my mother and father always had a discussion what time of day they got married. And uh, one said at 3 o'clock and the other one said 6. And uh, even though they, did, they showed us a wedding invitation. So when Kathy and I got married on the 12th of May, uh, we got married at noon. And this coming Mother's Day, which was Mother's Day when we got married, it'll be 50 years. Aww. Aww. That's awesome. Probably one of the most common things that happens to people every day is going to happen to me next week and hours away and I'm so excited and isn't it ridiculous I've been a labor and delivery nurse for 45 years and I'm still excited because I'm going to be a great grandmother sometime next week and I don't know I, I wish you guys would pray for me that they will allow me to bring this baby at this particular time in our church service so you could see him. Yeah. And it would, if that happened, that would be a miracle. <laughs> and so just pray for my granddaughter, Alexa, and for her husband, Nathan, that they will have a safe delivery, a healthy baby. And in this world in which we live, I was thinking that God let Moses be born in a very terrible time. And so this baby can be a real blessing. And just look, you're just looking at a, a, an excited great grandma. You know, as Judy, as you were talking about the flowers coming together, this spring, the red buds were absolutely yes. stunning. And so my lovely wife said, I said, what would you like for your birthday? She said, I'd love a red bud tree for our front yard. And I looked and looked and looked and looked and even hit a, a friend of mine who's a wholesaler and nope, don't have any. As I was driving home thinking, Lord, where can I find a tree for it? And as I turned onto our property, I looked to the left and there it was in all of its beauty, a tree on our property. So I dug it up and I had Sandra help me and um, a friend came the next day and we planted it in the front yard and it is beautiful. And then 48 hours l later, we both had poison ivy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, not only is God good, but, but uh, our family physician was most gracious, saw us at the last minute and got us on some steroids. So we're doing well now. So uh, my other, um, and this is a formal request, uh, Judy. My friend Steve, who has been fighting lung cancer, was just placed on ventilatory support at 4 o'clock this morning. And so I ask that you will uh, hold Steve and his wife Roxy up in prayer. Um, they're both tr trying to cope in their own way as, uh, as this uh, disease is kind of taking hold. Uh, so thank you. I just want to praise God. Uh, one of our dear members, Ellen, is going to have her 88th birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Ellen. 
So that's my praise. But I do have a prayer request. As I've been studying Acts and looking at all the persecution that the body of Christ was going through, I am reminded how protected we are here. But all across the world, there are our Christians, brothers and sisters, are being severely persecuted. And I just want to remember them in prayer. I, I just had a quick prayer request. Um, my doctor placed me on an antibiotic last a week and a half ago. I had some minor surgery, but unfortunately I reacted badly to the antibiotic and I got severe reaction to it. So I'm seeing an orthopedic doctor on Monday. It has settled into my right leg, but it causes inflammation, tendinitis, ruptured tendons. And right now my right knee is very swelled and it feels very, very unstable. So I'm hoping that they can give me some kind of a brace or something that I can at least walk better in and just pray that this reaction will pass because he said the best he could give me estimate was one to six weeks or longer. So <laughs> prayer would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Yes, there. Um, I was, had an unexpected prolonged conversation with my brother Femi during Sabbath school because neither of us had students. Um, and I realize now that that is a rare privilege that we enjoy as Christians to have our minds and spirits stimulated by a brother or sister when we come to church. And then we go back to work, child raising, and in my case, taking naps. And, um, <laughs> You know, these mundane things, but when we get to heaven, we'll be able to be with each other, stimulating each other, and then we don't have to sleep, it says, so no more naps. You are more than welcome to come work with me. I got more than enough plates to share. <laughs> um, happy Sabbath, first of all. Praise God, I'm here, and I was able to bring my mama with me Amen. today. Amen. <clears throat> We are definitely getting into some days where I remind her every minute of the same question. Um, and sometimes we last uh, half a day now. We don't usually make a good day anymore. But um, it is going quickly. So keep her in your prayers as well as Jaden's usual prayer. Get off his lazy butt. Um, start being a member of the household at least, if not society. And... Uh, Continue to pray for me for the strength and to continue to keep going and more than anything, keep my focus on Jesus. Okay, I'm, I'm thanks. I also want to give thanks. As some of you know, our neighbors moved out and left behind their cat, and she is so sweet and precious, and we found her a home. So I'm giving thanks for that. And I'm giving thanks for beautiful flowers that friends give to brighten your day. Sylvia gave me a clementus plant to put in my backyard, and it's beautiful. It's going to have purple flowers. And I just want to ask that you'll pray for my dear friend, Shirley. Um, she's not doing well. She has congestive heart failure, and she is in the hospital. Um, so we have been expecting this, but I just pray for her and her family. And then I have another dear friend who's just struggling with severe depression, so please just keep her in prayer. I forgot to add, um, Michael has surgery on his ankle. Finally, that's the thing that keeps making him fall, and he gets the surgery on the 7th. It's going to be a long recovery, and so pray for stability in his other leg to get him healed so he doesn't do more damage because they got to fuse it together. I just want to praise God for always hearing my prayer Amen. every time I pray, even if I'm not praying, just talking. So I, I work as a travel nurse, and uh, I had this contract to this hospital. So my recruiter, uh, he told me, don't say anything about the schedule, because if you do, then they're not going to let you work for them. So when they handed me my schedule for May, so I was supposed to work 
or Fridays, and I work night shift. So every time I work night shift on Friday, I can't come to church on Saturday. So when I look at the schedule, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to go to church? <laughs> like all the, all the four Friday for the month, I was supposed to work. But I was scared for asking about, oh, can you like change my schedule? So I'm like, I just keep thinking in my head, oh my God, please, please, I don't know what to do. And, and then I didn't even tell my recruiter because he told me, if you say anything about the schedule, they're gonna cancel you. So I didn't say anything. I just started to work in April and then keep working and working. And then in the, mid, in the middle of the April, there was this girl they hired. She came to work to our floor, she was new. And then all of a sudden she came to me, she said, okay, you know what, I don't like to work at, at uh, I, I just like to work my shift at the end of the week. She was like, can we change the, <laughs> our day so I can work your Fridays and you can work my Wednesday? I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, seriously? I'm like, oh, this could be only God who did this. So we, we switched all our schedule. Like, I didn't have to work, I, I would not have to work this May or the Fridays. She took all my Fridays. And then I took all her Wednesday. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Now I can be able to go to church. <laughs> I'll mm-hmm. praise the Lord because he, already, he, he always hears our prayers. Yes, he does. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God works the night shift too. Amen. Now, I think one more in the back. Yes, I just have a prayer request. Uh, my sister Anne's in the hospital with two blood clots in her stomach, so please remember her. Okay, thank you. You know, uh, Pastor, go ahead. Uh, my son uh, has uh, cats out in this place, and right now they have 12 adorable kittens that would be needing adapting, and if you feel like you need to have a pet in your life, this might be a good opportunity. They're, uh, they are loving well. cats. I've never seen so many of such loving cats as these cats. Wow. On the topic of cats, Pastor told you that she found a home for this cat that the neighbors left behind, but she didn't tell you who it was? That's my praise. (laughs) Um, We lost our cat back in, I think, the 1st of March, and uh, my husband was kind of looking for another one. And this one just happened to come probably at the right time. So just hope and pray that she likes us and we like her. So, or it, we don't know what it is yet. It's her. Okay. At this time, um, we are going to kneel for prayer. If you have difficulty kneeling, please bow in comfort. Dear Heavenly Father, God of love, our sovereign leader, ruler, guider. Lord, you take care of all the details of our life. We thank you for that. When we lay our plans before you, you fill in the details. Lord, you have heard the requests. You have heard the praises. We thank you for life that has been granted us and for the spring when things come to life. The flowers bloom. The leaves are on the trees. The birds are starting their families as well as other animals. We thank you for new new uh, kittens in the homes that they'll be blessing. We thank you for homes that will take in these animals and be blessed with their four-legged friends. Lord, we thank you for being with those that are having surgery and recovering from it. We ask you to be with those that are having bad re- responses to the medications and the after effects of it, that you will bless them. Lord, we ask you to be with all of us that are having older parents in our life, that we will know how to be with them, that we will be someone they can come to, even if they don't remember who we are, that we'll have the patience to be able to handle our conversations and our time spent with them, being blessed to still have them in our life. Lord, I'm trying to remember things. There are people that are traveling. Our pathfinders are in their camporee this weekend. Please help them to go without being drowned out. And Lord, there's a lot of rain down in Texas. They've had many roads that have been washed away 
just because of the rain. Please be with those that have lost things that they will rely on you to help them make their lives come back to sanity again. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give us in your word, so full of promises, so full of praises. Lord, you are a God of love, of forgiveness. We ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings every day. The things that we do, we say, that are not in harmony with heaven. And Lord, forgive us of the things that you ask us to do, that we neglect to do. Lord, help us to be willing to serve you, more willing every day. I ask you to anoint the pastor's words as she speaks to us today, that we will leave here refreshed and re-inspired to go from here to serve you. And Lord, I've asked you, as your disciples do, to teach you how to pray. And all I could think of was your prayer. So if all of us could come to you in your name, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into evitation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, James. That was absolutely lovely. You've made our eyes go towards heaven this morning. Little disclaimer on my sermon this morning. The title and the idea of the sermon came from a pastor friend of mine by the name of Adam. And I appreciated this sermon so much that I'm borrowing it. And I have revised and edited it to make it my own, which you'll be grateful because it used to be 16 pages long. (laughs) But I was thinking, how can I get across the same point in less words? And I, I think we are successful this morning. Dragon in the delivery room. Taken from Revelation 12, verses 1 to 4. And we will have a responsive reading for our scripture. Start, I'll do the white print, and Judy will lead you in the yellow. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Let's pray. (coughs) Father God, Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. I pray this morning that you will anoint my mind, my heart, and my lips to speak that which needs to be spoken. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's true, true saying that a mother's love for her children knows no danger, counts no cost, thinks not of itself, is a love that's as fierce as any wild animal, but as gentle as a dove. What's more, a mother's love and devotion often go unrecognized Ilian Jones wrote that once the New York Times was asked to help a woman's club decide on 12 greatest women in the United States. So they went together and they consulted together and they contemplated this and they came back and they told him these words. It said the 12 greatest women in the United States are women who have never been heard of outside of their own homes. God has indeed bestowed upon mankind a special gift in giving us the women in our lives. They were meant to be from the very beginning a special expression and example of his love for us. In fact, in God's word, it tells us that God himself has motherly qualities. And we're going to look at a few of those scriptures Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, if you will. And it says this, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals, the scurry along the ground. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So according to this text, it says in the image of God, God created male and female. Man was created, mankind was created, that both would reflect God. In the image of God. The scripture says that woman woman was created as much as in the image of God as man was created. And yet in many ways, women and men are entirely different, entirely different from each other. 
So when God created Eve, he was not just creating a helpmate for Adam. No, he was creating much more than that. Through Eve, God was revealing more of his image to us. Now, it's clear from many parts of the Bible that God has male qualities. We see those. And yet, in creating females, he reveals to us that he also possesses those qualities which we admire in the woman, in the women in our lives. Let's go look at Isaiah 66 in verse 13, and it says these words, I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. So here, Jesus, the, the creator is saying, as a woman, I comfort you. As, as a mother comforts her child, I comfort you. In Isaiah 49 and 15, it says, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel so can she feel no love for that child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. Sorry, I took your part. <laughs> and in Matthew 23, verse 37, it says these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks, beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. These are just a few of the motherly qualities possessed by God as revealed in Scripture. And in giving us mothers, grandmothers, wives, and aunts, it is God's desire to reveal those qualities of his characteristic to us. And one of the greatest qualities of a woman, however, and indeed the only quality which cannot man cannot possess is the ability to give birth to a child. And I think that if men could do that, there would be a lot less children in the world. I'm just saying. <laughs> the ability to give birth is a very special gift that God gave to women alone. And he gave them this gift, this capacity for giving life to another human being because it demonstrates his desire to give us life also. And to better understand that, what I'm trying to say, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Now, John chapter 3 is famous for the John 3, 16 verse, but I want us to read this first portion first, and we'll read it responsively. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After, After dark, dark one, one evening, evening he, he came, came to speak, speak with, with Jesus. Jesus. Rabbi, Rabbi, he said, we, we all know, know that God has set you to teach us. Your, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Exclaimed the how, How can, can an, an old, old man, man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Now, I want us to notice what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Now, Nicodemus thought Jesus was talking about the natural birth from our mothers, but what Jesus was really talking about was the spiritual birth. He was talking of a spiritual, supernatural birth, the spiritual birth that we receive when we become followers of God. God demonstrates the motherly aspects of his character when he gives new birth to those who come to him. This birth, we are told, is a spiritual birth. That is that we are given new life. We are born again. And when the Spirit of God comes into our lives. So what does this all mean? What does it mean that God doesn't just want to be our father? He wants to be our mother. He wants to give us new life. He wants to give us second birth, out of, not out of a womb, 
of our earthly mothers, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to make us his children, not by creation, but by redemption. The Bible says that he knit us together in our mother's womb. That's the first birth. And once we are born from our mothers, what he wants to do is to take us and knit us together with his spirit to receive life in us. That's what Jesus meant by being born again. Just as through the mother life is given to the child, so God desires that each one of us come to him to receive this new life, a life that will carry into eternity. And believe it or not, there is a connection between mothers and giving birth in the book of Revelation. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to go back to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we're going to read those again. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun and the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Now just briefly, if it's possible, my Seventh-day Adventist friends, can you suspend prophetic interpretation for a moment? Because we tend to do that immediately. Here in this vision, John sees what? A woman. He saw a woman, not just any woman, but a pregnant woman. And not just a pregnant woman, but a pregnant woman in labor. And in this vision, we find ourselves in a divine delivery room. And we see this woman enter who is ready to give birth. Now, for you mothers out there, I'm sure many of you remember very well the experience of giving birth. For most of us, it was no picnic in the park. <laughs> it was very difficult. It was hard work. And when a woman is ready to give birth, there is no turning back. And that's what we find happening in our scene here in Revelation 12. It's time for this child to be born. And there's no stopping it. Now, if this were a delivery room here on earth, the next thing that we should see is a doctor coming into the room to deliver this child. But notice who enters the scene of this vision. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Now, if we go down to Revelation 12 and verse 9, we find out who this dragon is. It is none other than Satan himself. The text says, This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. He seized the woman, sees that she's ready to give birth to this child, but rather than being there to help her deliver, the scripture tells us that the dragon has one purpose for being in the delivery room, and that is to devour the child as soon as it's born. No sooner is the child out of the mother's womb and the dragon is standing there to snatch it away. Now, just for a moment, please continue to not apply the prophetic. I want you to see the spiritual implications here, the devotional aspect of this prophecy. Not because the prophetic inter interpretation is wrong, because that's quite the contrary but because there is this deeper message to be found in this passage. So allow me to share that with you this morning. In this scene, the woman represents God. Now before you strike me down with heresy, please follow me through with this. The woman represents God, and the child this woman is giving birth to is the church. It's you and me. 
It's you and me. Remember the kind of birth God wants us to have? Spiritual. He wants us to have a spiritual birth. And here in Revelation 12, we see this born-again experience taking place. A child is ready to be born, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And someone has to come to God, and, and someone has come to God, and they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior by faith. And in experiencing the second birth, Jesus spoke of it in the passage that we looked at in John chapter 3. Now notice what happens at this point. The dragon, Satan, enters the delivery room. And what is his purpose for being there? To take the child and destroy it before it sees the light of day. Following through on this metaphor of being born again, what we can see is that as soon as someone comes to Jesus Christ and receives them as his savior, Satan is right there to destroy the experience. That's what he wants to do. To further drive home this message, let's apply the prophetic meaning. Applying the prophetic interpretation to what just happened, we know that the man-child being delivered was who? Jesus Christ. It could be nobody else. And who does the dragon lying in wait want to destroy the child at birth represent? The only answer that correctly fit this interpretation if we go look at history was King Herod. Because remember, when Jesus was born and they wanted to figure out who he was, so go kill all the children under age two so that he might be killed. So Herod comes into the scene and he wants to destroy the king, Jesus, as a child. The parallels are unmistakable. In the same way that Herod wanted to kill Jesus as soon as he was born, so the devil has made his, his primary purpose to be present in the delivery room of every new birth experience. Every person that gives their life to Jesus Christ, the enemy wants to destroy you. Jesus understood Satan's plans very well. And he explained these plans to his followers. And in order to protect them against the destruction the devil wanted to bring upon them, this is what he had to say about it. Jesus, read with me from John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Who is my Jesus, okay, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So Jesus wants to give this rich and satisfying life. But the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his purpose. Now it's clear that the thief here is Satan. And what Jesus says about the main purpose of the thief, I just said, is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And in this verse, we are reminded of Satan as that dragon, standing in the delivery room, just waiting to attack that child of God, being born by the Spirit. He's made his entire reason for being. Jesus says, to bring about our destruction. And from Revelation 12, we discover that he starts his attack as soon as we commit ourselves to become followers of Almighty God. Consider, if you will, with me for a moment, the temptation of Jesus Christ. When did that happen? Right after he was baptized. So Jesus went into the wilderness and Satan showed up and began to tempt Jesus, began to harass Jesus. And many of us went through the same experience. Before we made a commitment to Jesus Christ, we may have had some problems in our life, but no sooner did we step into that baptistry and all hell broke loose in our lives. And in many cases, and I mean literally, fell apart. Why is that? Because Satan knows that whatever he, whatever he was doing to keep you away from God before, he's going to have to do ten times more to get you now. 
He's going to try to bring you down and discourage you. He's going to bring sickness in your life. He's going to bring loss in your life. I don't know about you, but when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, that's exactly what happened. It seemed like the struggle became greater. The more that I wanted to follow Jesus, the more the enemy attacked me. Because Satan knows that whatever he was doing to keep you away from God before, he now has to do ten times more to get you away from God. When you were out in the world doing your own thing, it was easy. You were doing half the work for the enemy then. It didn't need to bother you as much. But in coming to Jesus, in coming and giving your life to him, and having that born-again experience, Satan realized that he would have to work double time to take you down. Now let, let me tell you, If you thought being a follower of Jesus Christ meant that life was going to be smooth sailing, sunshine and blue skies, then you're in for a surprise. And I don't mean to say that to sound flippant in any way. Because following Jesus is the best thing that I've ever chosen to do in my life. But when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, Satan pulls out every weapon in his arsenal. And he levels all of it squarely at you with this effort to get you to abandon the faith and give up the life you received when you were born again in Jesus Christ. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, I don't think it was an accident that Jesus used these three words. Nor do I believe it was by accident that Jesus put them in the order that he put them in. And in fact, as we consider what Jesus said, we discover that the devil's threefold plan of attack against God's children, and the good news is, is once we discover the plan of attack, we can be ready to fight. The first thing Jesus said the thief comes to do is to steal. What is it that he has come to steal? The answer is found in the last part of the verse because it says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus says why? So that we could have life and have it more abundantly. So he's come to steal our life, that abundant life. He doesn't want us to have a satisfactory life following Jesus. He wants to make it as miserable as he possibly can. In other words, Jesus came not to only give us eternal life, but to give us a satisfying life here on earth. He doesn't want us to be miserable. He wants us to have a happy, satisfying life. So don't for a moment think that God doesn't care about your life here on earth because he does. Throughout his ministry, Jesus spent time improving the quality of life for those around him. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He restored the hearing of the deaf. In these and so many other ways, Jesus was showing us that God cared about the condition of our life. So if Jesus wants to improve the quality of our life, then it would make sense that the devil would want to destroy it. His chief objective is to steal away whatever it is that God would give us that brings us contentment and joy. Many times in my life, I've been upset and discouraged because I just wanted a moment of reprieve from the enemy. But when we follow Jesus, the enemy is not going to stop. It's just not going to stop. And when we purpose in our hearts to serve God and to serve him no matter what, Satan will do what he can to seek and destroy. And I'm standing here today to tell you that Satan is a loser. We should have more amens on that. Satan is a loser. He's a loser because God wins. 
We need to go to the end of the story. God wins. God won when the sun hung on the cross. And when he was buried and resurrected, he conquered life for us. So that when we believe in him, we have eternal life. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Maybe some of you think, you know, Pastor Lori, it's just not that bad. But I dare say that some of you here are probably saying, oh, yes, it is. It is that bad. We see our families pulling apart. We see drug addiction. We see alcoholism. We see pornography addiction. We just see broken families. We see people losing their jobs and, and having struggles making ends meet. The thief has come to steal. And the thief does steal. He steals that which is important to us. He steals that which God has given to bring us enjoyment and contentment in life. He steals whatever he can to make us feel as miserable as he can. And yet as Christians, what do many of us do about it? In many cases, we kind of shrug our shoulders and we determine that it must be God's will. It's God's will for me to suffer. I'm sorry. I just read in John 10, chapter 10, that it was Jesus' desire for us to have life and have it more abundantly. It's the enemy's job to steal, not Jesus' job. He wants us to have a blessed life. And so we just shrug our shoulders and we say, it's just God's will. And I say it can't be God's will. It's the thief. It's Satan. God has come to give us life. Now, yes, I admit that God does allow Satan to run his course of evil in this world, but we have a choice how we deal with that. Because I believe that we can conquer the enemy because we have the Holy Spirit, because we have Jesus Christ. We claim God's promises. The thief comes in to steal, yet many times we don't do anything. And if we let go without any resistance, Jesus says the thief begins to kill. And what does he kill? He has stolen what he's, God has given to us to bring contentment and fulfillment of life. And, he, and if he's allowed, what he'll do next is kill our passion for life. There are people that have so much taken away from them that they can't seem to find any reason to get up in the morning. They have no energy. They have no zeal for life. Nothing motivates them anymore. Nothing holds meaning for them. They're afraid to let, to let life come in. They fear taking any risk because they've been hurt so many times. They fear letting themselves hope in something lest it's stolen away from them again. And there's emptiness in their eyes and a spark of life all but extinguished. And the enemy has stolen everything valuable to them. And in so doing has killed their very passion for life. Even more than killing our zeal for life, the enemy wants to kill our faith in God. How often... When something in life has been stolen from you, you find yourself asking the question, if God really cared, if God really, really cared, then he would intervene and make it better. Why didn't he save my marriage? Or why didn't he heal my child? Or why, is he take, why hasn't he taken my cancer away? The door is open to questioning. And in this manner of minutes, our mind is flooded with doubts about God's love for us, about his promises for us, that he wants to bring us contentment and joy. And we begin to question, and the questions lead to misgivings. And the misgivings lead to blaming God. And then we blame, the blame leads to an abandonment of our faith. And it's a slippery slope. Notice the progression. The enemy comes to steal that which God has given to bring enjoyment in life. Then he works to kill our desire to live that life and to have faith in God. That's where his final attack comes in. He seeks to destroy us, to destroy our very lives. 
And not only this life, but no, he seeks to destroy our eternal life. The enemy knows that by stealing away what God has intended for us, he can lead us to doubt in God and abandon the faith of Jesus and lose all passion for living. And then it's just a short step away from getting us to give up on everything and end it all. Now, I don't preach this lightly. How many times I've encountered individuals who have been suffering loss after being robbed of what they were sure God wanted for their lives and have wrestled with this thought of putting an end to it all. And the reason I don't take it lightly is because I was one of those people. The enemy robbed me. And I allowed him to get into my head. And I allowed him to take my joy. But my God won. My God intervened. He helped me to get past that with counseling, medication. There's nothing wrong with all of those things, people. It seems like an easy way out, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. There's a dragon in the delivery room of our lives. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, and he will steal and kill. He will destroy but only if we let him. We have to keep those promises in front of us. We need to rehearse the things that God has done for us, how he's blessed us. We started off this message this morning with about mothers um, and the motherly aspects of God. There's one other aspect of a mother that I want to leave with you today, and it's this, that a mother's love for her child will drive her to do whatever she has to do in order to protect that child. My children are in their 40s, and I would still do whatever I have to do to protect my children. Don't mess with this, Mama. And if we feel that way about our children, do you think God feels 10 times more that way? Absolutely. And if we are God's children, born again in him, we have the assurance that he is doing everything possible to fight off the thief and protect his kids. Youth instructor, I found this quote. It says, I, it says, could the veil be lifted from our eyes, we would see that the angels of God are around us to preserve us from unseen dangers. We have angels protecting us. Thousands of times has their care been especially manifested for us in our warfare with the agencies of Satan. How many times? Thousands of times. And I believe that. What we need to realize, friends, is that for God, this is war. The dragon is at work, but so is our creator. It is his desire, the enemy's desire, to destroy us. But like a mother guarding her children, God is fighting for us. But there's a role that we have to play too. And as children of God, born again in him, we too are at war. We must fight to preserve this life which has been given us. We need to put on the full armor of God. And that's another whole sermon. But God is ready to fit us for battle. I think often we see Satan as this distant enemy, you know, over there causing trouble somewhere else, that he's always at this arm's length. But I'm here to tell you that he is not over there and he is not at arm's length. He is in your face. And he's going to do whatever he can to destroy you. And we need, we need to use the weapons that the Creator has given us to fight off the enemy. We need to use the armor of God. Use his word, use prayer, use fellowship, pray for each other, claim his promises. The enemy is right there when you were born in, the, in Christ Jesus, and he's been right in front of you the whole time since then. And when you gave a new life in Jesus, the devil took it up as his only goal in your life to steal, to kill, 
and destroy. Now, I don't know about you, but this just kind of makes me mad. And I want to fight. I want to fight. From the moment that we are born from our mothers, we are in battle to survive. How much more of a battle we find ourselves when we were born again into Christ. We need to value this life that God has given us on earth. We only get to live it once. And how much more then should we should value the life that we will get to live forever. How much more fiercely we should be fighting against the enemy. How much more determined we should be to wage war to defend our new birth experience. Next weekend, we have a special opportunity to honor moms. I won't get to be here because I'll be burying my mom. But I'm here to let you know of how much we appreciate the life of the women that God has given us. One of the greatest honors we can ever give to our mothers is to live this life that they have given to us to its fullest. God also has given us life, given us new birth, and the greatest honor we can bring to him is to live that life as passionately and fervently for him as possible and to firmly and steadfastly fight with all that we have against anything that would come between us and that abundant life that God has given. As we take time to honor our moms for giving us life, so may we ever be mindful to honor God with the life that he has given us. And don't forget, Jesus wins. He gives us life abundantly. I'm going to invite Patricia and Dave to come up and we'll sing our closing song. Is my 
running out, it's running out to me. Goodness is running out, to, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. is running after it's running after me in all my life you have been faithful in all my life you have been so so With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Lord, we give testimony this morning that all our lives you have been faithful. I know there's many in this room today that could raise their hand and say that. Thank you, Jesus, for being faithful in my life. Thank you for watching over me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for giving a life that wants to bring joy. And even though we know the enemy wants to destroy, we have a Savior who wants to give us life and give it more abundantly. So we claim that this morning. We focus on that. Lord, and I pray that each person in this room, that you will give them the hunger to spend time in your word, including me. Help us to claim your promises. Help us to be people of encouragement and joy. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for chasing after us and for never giving up on us. We love you. We thank you for the goodness of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Mm -hmm. 